Damn. PJ, thanks for joining me, brother. Thanks for having me. It's good to see you again. Yeah, always a pleasure. Um, how we start the podcast off, where in your life right now are you chasing edges? Where are you learning, growing? Good question. I'm pushing hard into relationships. I just got married, so I'm looking mm. to become a better partner. And uh, my wife and I are looking to start a family, so I've just started diving into parenting. So that's that's really where I'm I'm pushing. Obviously, I'm always doing stuff physically, trying to improve my performance and all the fun, crazy activities that I like to do. But those are the two newest areas that I'm diving into. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, I always uh, th that becomes a topic. It's kind of like split where people always want to throw out something like tactical or like some new performance style they're training with. But the other like the other 50 percent, it's like some. I, I just think a lot of people don't look at the tangible metric of like, they usually want more, or like they're solving enough, but like deeper relationships, better connection. Like that's always a, a massively valuable endeavor. So like, I, th I think that, so what exactly are you learning in the parenting world? Uh, just started exploring. I mean, I've just started talking to, I'm gathering information on like where to go for information right now. Um, right. You know, my wife and I have been talking a lot about just our principles in mm -hmm. You know, families and children and belief systems and stuff like that, trying to kind of create a foundation of, of a, you know, a value system that we agree upon. And then we just been talking to friends who have kids. Obviously, I have a, I have a lot of friends who are uh, recently parents or have young children who I think are very thoughtful in their approach to everything, very conscious in how they approach things. So I'm always, you know, talking to people like that. Uh, just to find out where they go for information. Cause I think most people just live lives unconsciously. So yeah. I don't really give a shit about like the guy who lives down the street and his tips on parenting, even though he's never really put any thought into it. Uh, so I'm just trying to, and obviously when it comes to parenting and there's a billion books and information out there. So it's hard to sort through and find the stuff. I'm trying to find the people that I trust for information so that I can start digging into the information. Cause that's a tough it's easy for me in the performance world. I can sort through the BS pretty quickly, people, but I have zero experience in parenting. So uh, yeah, just a, the very, very tip of the iceberg. Yeah, it's a new mountain to climb, but that's really cool just because uh, I know you, I know a little bit about your analytical nature as far as like the performance goes and like your spectrum of capability there. So it's cool to see you start the filtering process to get to the right information, which I think is a key step in anything anybody's doing, particularly something new. And even like I, I get into it when I start talking about like goal setting, you kind of need to have that first mass there. Like what relationships are you taking into these goals you're making or what contracts are you making with yourself or what stress you're picking up before you even start to look and pick up all the shiny things or go after all the shiny things. So I, I just, again, big fan of your process. And then uh, for those of you listening, um, I've been uh, following PJ for shit six or seven years now um in that world and then we had the luxury of uh, or the opportunity the privilege of training with him a bit out in hawaii and in la and it's been uh it's been awesome just because he's a great um carrier i, I call him the prometheus is a, a great uh uh fire share in the world of breath and performance where uh, his, his two companies he's affiliated with is the XPT Life, uh, Laird and Gabby's company, um, that where he's the director of performance and also Fit Labs. But he's uh, very well versed in all performance tactics, in particular the breath world, obviously. But the breath world in relationship to, I know he's trained. You, you've trained what 80, 100 plus fighters at this point, and then um, now you're getting into the military world. So I'd love to start uh, getting into the application there how you um, are starting to apply the breath work to, but I mean, I, I, actually let's start with the UFC stuff. Um, when did you start applying that and how has your process filtered over the years? I started applying breath work with my athletes. I was training a lot of jujitsu fighters and MMA fighters back in uh, the tail end of my training career. So I think I started applying breath work probably around 2015. I had a coach who had just taught me some really simple down regulation principles. Uh, like the post-workout breathing was one of the first things that I started implementing. And uh, that was something that I, I loved because I, the athletes I work with were so hard charging, driven, broken down, never uh, recovery was such a huge element for them. So being able to implement this short post-workout breathing routine that helped to down-regulate after our workouts was great. And I, and I think did wonders for the athletes I was working with. 
Uh, and then I learned just a little bit about how to downregulate after high intensity activity. And most of that was just like focusing on the breath and trying to slow it down. That was really the, the majority of the knowledge I had at that time. Uh, but the big thing that I started implementing was being active about your recovery. So I used to drill into my athletes that in between sprint intervals or activities, whatever we're doing, if you have 30 seconds, 60 seconds to rest, that's part of the workout. And your job during that is to implement the mindsets and the protocols and the techniques that we're learning to try to recover so you can perform better on the next round, the next interval, whatever it is. Uh, so that's what I started doing early on. And, and again, I had super limited knowledge. Um, and it wasn't until I started, uh, I think 2016, 2017, I took the art of breath course with, with Brian McKenzie and, and Rob Wilson. Uh, so I got a little bit more in-depth knowledge there. And then quickly after that, I joined with XPT and my job became learning everything there was to know about breath work. So that's when I did a deep dive and uh, started implementing some of that with my athletes. Oh, that's awesome. Um, yeah. And I, I think that's like the awareness is always a great first step when you start to get into breath work and understanding that you're not like most people, again, are unconscious of this and like you even referred to it in their parenting but unconscious of your breath it's there with you every movement every rest every work set and those kind of things and you're either going to be a victim and let let it kind of go and do its own thing or start to gain some uh agency back and some control so i always like that that first layer is always awareness like and then educate like a little bit of education which again is based down regulation how am i breathing what hole am i breathing out of how long am i breathing everywhere and after that it's now it starts to get into like the the fine tuning stuff as far as like the actual strength training, conditioning training, that kind of thing. Is there anything where after you started through the again, the kind of the basics as you start to apply to your your jujitsu guys and your fighters that started to gravitate that still hold hold true today? Like some of those fundamentals as far as like training their aerobic capacity or whatever. Yeah, I think the the few things that really uh, played over or, or still carry over those two things I first started with. I'm mean, obviously I learned a lot more about the techniques for down regulating. So there was more of a, a mechanical approach and it wasn't just like focus on slowing your breathing. Um, although that worked really well, I always give the example. I, I had two athletes once we were doing this assault bike thing and one athlete showed up late and I had been working with the other athlete, both MMA fighters, both professional fighters, uh, I had been working with this female athlete prior to the, the session and just giving her some tips on breathing and having her really focus her mind on her breathing in between intervals. And the other guy I didn't tell him anything. He showed up and just kind of jumped into the session and their ability to lower their heart rate in between intervals because we were monitoring that. She was lowering her heart rate. Uh, I think it was like 15 to 20 beats per minute more than he was. He was staying after like the second or third interval. He was dropping five to 10 beats per minute and she was dropping like 25 to 30, uh, just by really focusing on her breath. And I think a lot of that was the psychology of, you know, every time we finished this interval, he was going, ah, 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 and he was focused on how much it sucked and how much his legs hurt. And she just, she had an intention. So her mind went off of all of that suck and went over onto focusing on her breathing. And then she was taking deeper breaths because she was aware of it. So, uh, I've implemented some more tactics to that, having a better understanding of the actual physiology of breathing. So I have more uh, principles behind that method. Uh, but I think that was something that was super impactful. Uh, another area that a lot of almost every professional athlete I've worked with really enjoys is pre-workout, more like pre-competition stuff, things to get their, their respiratory system warmed up, but mostly it's to get in the right headspace. It's to get their, their mind prepped for performance and it's interesting where we can dive into this a little more if you want to, but it's interesting the differences in, in uh, preference because I have some athletes that want things that are at one end of the breathing spectrum and other athletes that are like, no way I could never do that. I only, I want things at this end uh, and they're all high performers and they're all getting ready to perform on the biggest stage in their respective sport. Uh, so I think that's always really cool to see the differences in, in how people are using these things and what they enjoy and what preps them for perf or performance. Uh, and then I, I've played with a lot of other stuff, that, but there's nothing that like, we did a bunch of um, respiratory muscle training with one of my athletes uh, as he was getting ready for some top, top five uh, competition, but he was somebody who would like, I mean, he's been peaking in every other area. So he was like, okay, let's, let's find these things that might give us that little 1% difference. 
Um, the majority of athletes that come to me have done nothing when it comes to breathing. So it's, it's usually starting at the base and building good mechanics and, uh, nasal breathing is always a big thing that I work on just to improve their, their functionality with that. Um, so yeah, it's, it's across the whole spectrum. It's really like figuring out what they, what they need. And what I find is that you have to treat professional athletes as humans first and athletes second, and 80% of what they need is the same as the average person that I run into. They just need it much more focused and, uh, they need it a little bit further. Yeah. It's been off their radar for the most part, but again, everything you're talking about, like I always hear, I just, he screams energy conservation. And then now you start getting into the, the, the competitive na- nature of these humans where it's compound interest between each rep on the bike with the example you had, which is a dynamite example in that world. And, but now it's okay. Every rep between snaps on the football field or shifts on the ice. Like I, I that's where I, I feel the compound interest of, yeah, like great mechanics will set this foundation and then I'll use the tools accordingly. And then now it's just, I think the cool thing. And if you have any examples that, that stand out in the world of like, guys on different ends of the spectrum as far as pre-workout because i i've seen the same thing and i've I, i've gone through the whole roller coaster myself where like i wanted to be kind of like auctionated amped up in that realm where i got into a little bit more faster paced hyperventilation or now it's like energy conservation even the three hours going into the game am i aware of my breath and then really like the whole the environment and if I'm taking pre-workout, I'm doing all these things anyways, really, I just need to kind of mitigate the environment and the stressor. So it's like, okay, I'll bring myself down, find a focus. And then I just play little games to get a little more oxygen to my brain and go. But uh, any examples that kind of stand out as far as the, uh, the polarity, like the guys at one end of the spectrum versus the other? Yeah, absolutely. I, I had two athletes I was working with at the exact same time, both UFC fighters. And I think the both liked protocols at very other, very different ends of the spectrum based on um, what they enjoyed and and who they were and and, and kind of what challenges they faced going into it. So one athlete, she was very scared when she'd get a fight day. She was tons of anxiety and any type of hyperventilation protocol pushed her way further down that spectrum of anxiety. So she did all down regulation, slow controlled things, short tidbits. She never wanted to like sit and do it for 30 minutes. She needed like two minute, hey, you're feeling a little bit uh, amped up. You know, we still have six hours to kill. Let's just sit down here. Let's just do a two minute breath protocol. And if it was like, go sit down and do 15 minute breath protocol, that was in, that, that added anxiety. Yeah. There was too many things. Uh, whereas the other athlete, this was the kind of guy who was like, he was awake, like punching pillows in the hotel room at 7 a.m. And we still got 13 hours till we fight. So for him, he really enjoyed the, the uh, faster pace stuff. So for him, it was actually teaching him to use the tools because in the locker room, he liked to do a 20, 30 minute breathwork protocol just to kill time because he had, you know, he gets in the locker room and starts to get geared up. And then he's got two and a half hours until he walks out. So just to give his mind something to do, I would take him on like a breath work journey and he would do some hyperventilation and some breath holds and a whole bunch of that kind of stuff mixed in. Uh, but earlier in the day, it was, it was emotional management. So it was, it was giving him just enough of the higher intensity stuff to keep him interested so that he would do it for 10 minutes or so, but also tricking him with down regulation because I knew like, we can't be redlining it at 7am. We, you know, and and that was what he came to me. He specifically came to me because he won every fight going to the UFC and then got in the UFC and he would win first round every time, second round, hit or miss, lose the third round and he'd lose fights. And uh, so he came to me saying he had a conditioning problem and I put him on the bike and did some tests. And I was like, his VO2 max was like off the charts. And I was like, you don't have a conditioning problem. You have an energy management and emotional management problem. So I need to teach him how to use his mindset, his breathing and his tools to use energy in the right times and not, you know, you have to have a professional athlete approach. It's not a street fight. You can't street fight everybody in the UFC because your street fighting fuel burns out at about minute two and a half of the first round. And then you're coasting on fumes and then your tank's empty and you're just like trying to survive to see if you win this fight. So Uh, those were two different things. And I had a bunch of NHL goalies who were very similar that I worked with because uh, they had, 
the ones who were deeper in breath work, they liked the more intense protocols to do earlier on. And then those who were especially younger guys, I had a couple who were first few years in the NHL, the pressure of being an NHL goalie, they needed down regulation stuff to just get them calm and centered and focused. Uh, so it was just interesting to see that like the dichotomy of athletes and preferences in those spectrums and figure out when they want something, how do you give them just enough of what they want, even if it may not be what they need, because, uh, you know, you may, you may have football guys, I'm sure as a football guy, I know it's all, everything's get ramped up, get it, get energized, get ramped up. There's a time and a place for that, but, uh, maybe some guys would do much better of like coming back down. Yeah. And you see that in the realm where like a lot of guys will get out there and like the, that sympathetic nature, that full drive ran my head and everything that moves, it takes away from the chess part of the game where like, I, I think of like middle linebackers, you just linebackers in general, having to communicate between the D line and, and on back into the secondary where like, you can't be just 10 out of 10. And I know like the simplest form where like, Oh, I want to be seven out of 10 controlled chaos in that realm is kind of the message, but it's done with tools. And you never, and what you, I mean, what you've learned and what I'm learning uh, in my coaching journey is that you don't want the breath to be a stressor either, where you, where you have those athletes where it's like, and because I, I was coaching Ohio State's baseball team and they were running sprints and they, I had told them about the benefits of nasal breathing. So they think like nasal breathing, Brian's here. So mid conditioning, they, they, uh, they make eye contact with me and they shut their mouth, like in between like rep seven and eight. And I like, that's not the recipe either, where it's the application of the tool and not pulling it into the world of stress. Cause like you already have enough stress in the realm of competition, you know, like as a coach, like, yeah, what's enough. And then now you get into the want and need game where it's then even into the behavior. I think that's really cool as far as like the emotional regulation, like, yeah, because I, I always find it interesting where I, I enter these athletes lives right now as like a breath work coach, but it very, you can't talk about the breath without talking about psychology, emotions, behavior, things like that. Cause they're all intertwined that tightly. And that's where I think, um, obviously under your tutelage, Laird and Gabby, that whole crew, everybody in the industry has been awesome as far as mentoring me and sharing information in that world where that's where those illustrations, I think people need to hear in general because they, I see some people adopting it, uh, in interesting ways, particularly the hyperventilation stuff where like, to me, like that's the shiny part of the world where it's like, I can definitely make you feel something to maybe adopt the understanding of the breath that it's not yoga, woo woo, whatever, um, but I, like, I just see the extremes of it now where I, I, like, I had to go and experience it for myself a couple of times before I could judge it. But like the holotropic, all the fast paced, crazy breathing, where a lot of the people I was sitting with were already anxious and kind of like not built for that realm. And I, they use it as like trauma and spiritual healing. And I don't want to judge it too hard. Uh, but in that realm, it didn't seem like that was the right tool to pass to these people on a one touch method. Uh, like uh have you seen that have you kind, kind of do you kind of sympathize or empathize with that perspective absolutely i think uh i think the the analogy or the the cliche of like when, when you give somebody ham a hammer everything looks like a nail when it comes to breath work there's a lot of one size fits all approach and and i think the um absolutely not somebody to knock the wim hof method i do it i like it i mean i don't follow it exactly but he pushed a lot of this stuff into the mainstream, which is awesome. It has tons of people interested in breath work. I, I'd say early on in our courses, 50% of the people who showed up to an XPT course to learn about breath work were either Wim Hof certified or went to a Wim Hof workshop. So I think it's great. But I always say like the Wim Hof method style of breathing is like doing a heavy back squat. Mm -hmm. If you ask me how many of my athletes have a back squat at any given time, it's probably less than 5%. That's not because it's not a great exercise. It's just, it's one, one of thousands of tools that I use to improve an athlete's performance. I don't train power lifters. So none of my athletes have to compete in the back squat. So I think that's kind of the approach is, is uh, starting to understand what these tools do and making sure that you're not, that you're using the right tool for the job. Uh, nasal breathing is another really good example. It became really popular. Patrick McCune was talking about it. James Nestor came out with this book and then it was like, oh, nasal breathing is the thing, right? Like you should always nasal breathe. I'm always only, and I'm like, not really. It's great. It's a great start. If that's the first thing you learn about breath work and you try to nasal breathe as much as you can, you're going to do more good than you are 
negative, but like, it's probably going to impact your performance and your fitness. But for 99% of the world, that doesn't matter. Yeah. If you're a professional athlete and you come to me and you're trying to figure out how to use these tools, then it is going to matter. If you're, if you've been trying to jam yourself into nasal breathing all the time and it's hindering your performance, that actually matters in your, in your world as an athlete or military. Uh, and I think you, you also touched on something really important, which is the breath. It should only be a stressor when it's the focus. If, mm-hmm. if my goal of this session is to challenge your nasal breathing, then breathing's a stressor. That's the point. But most of the time, breathing is the tool that we're using to improve performance or efficiency or whatever. Um, I had a, a, a guy who plays for the Padres who just I just started working with. And when he reached out, the, his biggest thing was like, I just don't know. I got all these coaches. He's got a breathwork coach and a mobility coach and, a you know, baseball, five different baseball coaches. And he's like, I just don't have time in the day to keep stacking 30 minutes of things on. And I was like, I am going to help you. And he already had done the when all of his teammates are like, you got to do this. You got to do this. I got this guy. You got to do this guy. And everybody you talk to has a different approach. And that's part of the problem with having 10 specialists is all 10 of them think that their approach is the most important. So when he came to me, I'm like, look, it it sounds like a lot of your buckets are full. I'm going to give you one or two things and I'm going to keep it really simple on how to apply them. And ultimately what I'll give you two other options. So if you find yourself on a Sunday afternoon with like, I have nothing to do, I want to do something, do it. If you don't do it for the first month of us training together, I don't care. I want this to be simple for you to implement. I'm going to give you the easiest targets for you to hit. And at any point, if breathing becomes a stressor or you can't figure out where to put it in, cut it out. And that's what I want you to feel like with this stuff. And I think that means a lot to him coming from me because he's reaching out to me as a breathwork coach. So it's really hard when you when you reach out to a mobility coach, they want you to do 10 hours of mobility a day because mobility is the most important thing. And if you don't do it, you're going to break all of your body parts and you're not going to perform and you're going to die. You know, that's the approach a lot of people take. So I think when it comes to me and I'm like, look, if you got to cut out the breath work, that's the first thing to go. Then that helps people uh, find. And, and it's not always, but then it, if I go, you need, to, you need to cut that session out on Tuesday and you need to get your breath work in, then he knows that it must be really important because I understand the value of all the other pieces. And I think that's the performance coach approach to breath work that I've always tried to take because I'm a performance coach first. I spent 15 years of my career training athletes and most of those years were not around breath work. So when people come to me about breath work or recovery or saunas or ice baths, and I'm like, let me teach you how to put these and let me teach you the importance of these in your program. Because if you're cutting out physical training to do sauna sessions, as an average person, you're missing the mark. Uh, yeah. So that, that's kind of the thing I think is really understanding the principles. And that's always what I've tried to do is, is give that performance coach tools based approach so that you can figure out how to use the right tool for the job. Yeah, but I think that's a really great way, one, to earn trust really quick, like not trust because it's coming from like a massive place of knowledge, too, in that realm. But again, you get into the mobility world where again, like in their rule, like in their world, I had a cool guy on here, uh, Charlie Weingroff. I don't know if you know him, but in that realm, like we, we found the point that like, if you, like, if you gave the coach a choice to coach and lose or like sit on the bench and watch the game and win the championship, the coach wants to coach, like particularly now you get into specialties of the the performance field, like the mobility wants you to do mobility, um, acupuncture wants more acupuncture, whatever, like whatever the modality ends up being. But in that realm, I think the best coaches know when it's like, okay, I know my influence on you. And I know the influence of 10 other humans. Cause a lot of times, like none of these other 10 parts or these 10 specialists, like it's not a badge of honor to have 10 specialists that don't communicate with each other. The goal is to have all these people maybe even function on the same assessment protocol, so they know and they're speaking the same language, but usually that's never the case, particularly in like pro sports where these guys are just like, no, nah, Tuesday, Thursday, I got functional masseuse, acupuncture, IV, and then it go, just like kind of stick to their system where it's not an ideal system because they're picking up stress and all these things because they have appointment dates, they have time, they're committing. But now you get into a coach that is evaluating their whole system, these performance coaches like yourself um, and again, able to find the levers and find, again, the simplest insertion of a tool to get the, again, most leverage from it. I think that's, I think, I just think that's really cool in the, in the world because I just, I get frustrated. I got frustrated with um, 
other people like when I was playing just to have other of these the specialists like pull at me and like force me into their schedule and all these other things when like no like I don't I don't need these things more like I'm doing fine without them kind of deal yeah I, th I think a big problem and, and something I've probably been fortunate to have to deal with is there's so much ego in the industry that it's a it's a me first mindset even though it's like oh I, I'm all about my athletes but I'm all about my athletes when they're doing my program and my stuff because I'm the smartest. And I think I came up against that so many times in my career that I was like, how can I be the most effective for these athletes? Because I know what it's like to be an athlete and to have a training program and be excited about it and then be traveling and have two weeks in this other area. And I talk to this local college that lets me come in and do my thing. And then that strength coach is like, oh, let me see what you're doing. And then they just start sh talk shit on my program. And all it does is confuse me. Right. Yeah. All, I, all I, I'm left with like, well, should I do your program for two weeks or should I do my guy's program? So I always and in the MMA world, it is way worse because mm -hmm. there is no professionalization, especially when I started working with MMA athletes 13 years ago. It's in the Stone Ages when it comes to strength and conditioning and all that. Every MMA coach and they work with five of them. So they have a wrestling coach, a boxing coach, a jitsu coach. They all think that they're their conditioning coach. They're their mental toughness coach. They're their schedule planner. And they're the most important person in the camp. And you just battle. And then these fighters get destroyed because every session is conditioning. And they would go to boxing and they're coming to me afterwards. My title is strength and conditioning. So our session is called conditioning. They do an hour and a half of boxing or wrestling. And they're like, they come to me, they can literally barely move. And they're like, oh, we, we only spent like 15 minutes doing technical work. And then we just conditioned for 90 minutes. And I'm like, yeah, I don't know how to work with them. So, but again, instead of being like your boxing coach is an idiot, I was like, oh, okay, no worries. Then we got the conditioning out of the way. Why don't we focus today on actually rehabilitating some of those injuries that you had so we can help you. And the goal was always, and then I would reach out to these coaches and try to be as humble as I could because I knew fighting them with ego and like showing them how smart I was, wasn't going to work. So I would always reach out and say, Hey, really cool. What you're doing. I'd love to understand it more so I can support and make sure that what I do doesn't conflict with what you do. Um, even you'd get college athletes that come out for the summer and, or professional athletes, and they've got a program from their strength and conditioning coach. Even if I'm going to train, the athlete would show up and be like, I'm not going to do this shit. I want to do what you do. And I'd be like, okay, let me reach out to your strength and conditioning coach. Let them know I'm going to be working with you for the next eight weeks. Let them know I took a look at the program and I would love to implement the most important parts of it. Um, I'll make some modifications because I have the luxury of seeing this person day to day. Uh, it doesn't always work. A lot of coaches are like, you know, they don't, they, they look at it as a, especially I'm sure you've seen in the professional world where athletes have the strength and conditioning coach for the team, but they all have their own personal person that they work with. Yeah. So then the strength coach for the team is like, you know, F all these independent guys that, you know, think they're smarter than me. I'm the head strength coach for whatever team. Uh, but it was always just good to me to, to reach out, find out how we can work together versus work against each other so that uh, it's not on the athlete because the athlete's the one who's going to get the short end of the stick. They're the one who's going to get overtrained. They're the one who'll be confused because there's eight different people telling them that the other person is stupid. So I was like, I, I just need to make sure that I am not adding to that stress bucket for this athlete because I'm a performance coach. So if you're around me, your relationship with me should lead to improved performance. Even if that means I'm improving performance by being the one with no ego, who's just helping to, you know, manage your emotions about all the other stuff. Yeah. No, um, I, th I think that's dynamite though. And I'm, I'm sure, I'm sure the good strength coaches, they like thoroughly like appreciated that because I've, I've been, I've sat with strength coaches, like my NFL strength coaches through my whole career. And there's, they're just like, whenever we get back to OTAs, cause usually I'd come back a few weeks early and get working with that coach beforehand, just keep the rapport good. And he goes, I don't even, I don't know what we're going to get. I don't know what we're going to get. And then even, um, I think it was 2016 with Luke Richardson, when he came in, they did the whole FMS screening Nord board, the whole gauntlet of, of their testing. And they determined our team was functionally unfit to run. <laughs> and like, and, but that, that's how I really dove into breath work. And I, I felt the effects and saw the the lever there. Cause I was doing, um, the Texans were paying for like the sensory de deprivation chamber at the time. And I wasn't handling that very well. I hadn't done much meditation and all that kind of stuff. 
I was just learning. I, I read about some things and uh, sleep by Nick Little Hales, who referenced Patrick McCown, got me into oxidative advantage, got me following all you guys, all that kind of thing. Um, but I started just holding my breath and I Googled and how do I hold my breath longer? Wim Hof and free diving. So I went down that so I could hold my breath for four, over four minutes. And this was just in sequence with Luke determining that our team was unfit to run because everybody showed up uh, just a whole mismatch. Like some people like we had like two perfect scores on the FMS test and they were still held out because it's just like a whole team deal. But besides the point. But then we, once we started back conditioning, I could hear other people fatiguing faster. And that's where I kind of learned this language of physiology where it's like, okay, I know what blood in the water looks like now from a respiratory standpoint. I know how to then now learning from you guys, um, Dr. B, uh, Brian McKenzie, that whole, all the, all the people and all the dogs in the industry. And then also, yeah, then I, I didn't even give that shout at the beginning. Uh, PJ also um, quarterbacks and uh, not quarterback, sorry, bad, my, my own default verbiage, but yeah. um, he run, he ran and put out the XPT performance coach certification on there. And I took that and it was dynamite as far as like the, introing that whole world of breath and mechanics, but also these tools, how to implement and where to plug them in, like all the fundamentals we talked about at the beginning of this, he crushes it on there and even looks at the system as a whole. Then you start to implement some of the other uh, modalities that XBT uses to and it's absolutely awesome. I'll link that in the show notes just for those of you listening. But um, yeah, besides the point, like I just think that with that coaching communication that you were able to implement, it's just I, I felt like that had to be like, like very, they'd be very receptive to that. But again, like you never know what you're going to run into. For the most part in the professional space, they were uh, because to your point, they don't know who's going to, they don't know what people are going to show up with. If, if you play for the Texans and you go back to Southern California for the off season, they don't know if you're just going to dick off in Newport beach and, you know, have barbecues and get drunk and stuff like that. Or if you're going to be training. So I know when I was a college strength coach, I would give athletes programs for the summer. And most of the time, if they told me they had a place they were training, I was like, use my program as a template. If you have a coach that will be there with you, I don't care if you scrap my whole program. You know, like use that as a template so you know what I expect of you when you show up, give it to your coach and let them do what they want with you. Hopefully you find a good one because whatever one, an educated coach, even a lower, a less educated coach or a less experienced coach with you one-on-one -on -one every day is going to do more for you than my template-based program that I wrote for the whole team to do over the summer. Because that was just like for the person who goes home and has no access to anything, here's something you can follow or try to follow. Uh, so it's definitely, it's definitely good. It, it's, it was much harder in the MMA world. Uh, it was very often I would get no response to these long reach out messages I would send. Uh, I would show up to practice and try to talk to coaches. And like, there was definitely, there was a bunch of coaches who like gave me lip service about it. But then I found out later were telling their athletes not to go train with me. Uh, so they're just people, yeah. I mean, they're just archaic in their thinking. I mean, some of these coaches were literally like think that all fighters should do is like run and do the, do fighting and yeah. like all strength and conditioning is bad and going to hurt them and slow them down. So a lot of these people were really archaic in their thinking and it was tough, but I had a few that were really cool, um, which made it just a, a much better approach for those athletes and really, really helped to bring professionalism to the the approach that we had. Yeah, it's just such a it's such a tough industry in that realm that it is incredibly tough. Like it's mental toughness across the board. It's conditioning nonstop. And then you also have the multidimensional effect of MMA where it is mixed martial arts, where it's a bunch of specialties rolled into one combination of a fighter. And it's like I can see how very easily like jujitsu wants to work on his weaknesses, boxing, Muay Thai. They just want to fight over all that kind of stuff. And like, I, I do believe that like, uh, like, yeah, you should spend a lot of time sport specific as far as like, do like playing and training your sport. But uh, the more I learned to, I guess, take off the go from a, a workhorse into a like a racehorse concept instead of like, all I knew was work. And so like, my, some of my mistakes in my career was going to train with the probably Adrian Peterson's of the world um, at their gyms, because the, but the separator for them was always work capacity. So in my head, if I was working the hardest, which a lot of UFC fighters like, oh, I'm going to outwork you. I'm going to beat your ass. I've, I see those those mindsets uh, correlating pretty closely. 
but really like once you actually learn and feel how like i think the breath is a great uh transition into this world because once you feel what true recovery is and now what is op like what is optimized for me in the realm of like strength power and endurance like again you're not going to get reap the benefits of all the training you're doing if you can't recover from it and yeah. i just think the breath is like a cool okay we'll add the post-workout transition um we'll add the tools you'll feel the tools like okay let's dummy them as quick as possible and you guys do this at xpt where like and i want to transition to some of the pool stuff but okay this time we do one of the holds in the pool do the do the transition this time don't which one was easier okay the tools are functional and they're just such an easy coaching uh tactic but um unless you have anything else to add, I'd love to just uh, pick your brain on like the pool training philosophy, because I've had some people chirp the podcast about it. Like, obviously, um, who was the first fighter that brought it in? Uh, Adesanya, like what, like he was the first person who got some pretty big public notice outside of the people that go and train at the playground of the, the Reese and Hamilton household. But mm -hmm. uh, in that, in that world, the uh, Adesanya, what's his coach's name out there? I think it's Wood is his last name. I can't remember. Um, I think it's New Zealand or Australia. Yeah, some guy and, in New Zealand. They do some yeah. cool stuff, breath work, ice, uh, you know, cold plunge, pool stuff. They do a lot of good stuff. I don't know the guy personally, but just from the clips I've seen, I'm like, okay, they're, they're, they're at least playing with the right tools. Yeah. And that's where uh, I'd love to, for you to hear your philosophy on it, because then I saw uh, uh, Brian McKenzie doing some of that stuff with Bones Jones on this most recent fight. They, they did a little segment on it. And obviously I learned all that whole world from you. Um, so if you just want to break down the pool training a little bit, as far as the, the tactics or even just the, the underlying principles. For sure. The, the pool training, I think is one of the most magical things that we have at XPT for a variety of reasons, but most of the reason that it's so magical is its ability to induce situations, uh, that we can't really mimic anywhere else. And I don't mean that purely physically pool training is awesome physically, right? It's, People kind of understand that the pool unloads some of the impact forces. So it allows us to do ballistic training and a bunch of other cool explosive training without a lot of eccentric loads. So it can be great for recovery workouts for athletes in the, I mean, athletes been doing this stuff all the time. I'm sure you guys had recovery days where you got in the pool and you did some high knees and some stuff like that. The nice part about our pool stuff is it's way more fun than all that boring crap. So yeah. it's the same concept. It's just, we have more fun ways to apply it. Uh, but then as you start to get into the deep pool, there's another element to the pressure and that pressure, uh, I, there, this hasn't really been studied, but, you know, Paulie is one of our advisors, uh, Paul DeToro wanted to do some studies on the lymphatic drainage that's potentially happening for, uh, and that's why I think it could be really powerful for, he was looking at it specifically for military and treatment of TBIs and possible prevention of TBIs. But obviously that goes into the sports world too. Um, very, very theoretical, but the, the deep water adds a whole nother element with the pressure, the compression of the deep uh, water, but also the psychology of it. Because when you remove that floor for people, uh, it adds the element the, the true primal element of fear. And the coolest part about that is that it's, there's not many things that you can do where you can experience fear, anxiety, stress at its highest and most extreme form where you're still safe. Right. And then that's what I found with my fighters. Uh, it's impossible for me to find a, a thing with my professional fighters where we put them in a situation where they were, they literally broke down mentally and they're like, I can't do this. They have spent their entire lives figuring out how to push harder, push through everything, overcome everything. And now they're at the point that they spend three, four hours a day in the gym fighting against the best fighters in the world. So anything I can do in the gym is never going to mimic, is never going to put them to in that, in that position where they're like, I can't do this um, and, and actual fear. And that's one of the challenges with, with fighters specifically, or, or all athletes is fight night mimics that because the stress of fight night is I could get knocked out in front of millions of people. I could lose my whole career. Like this could be the last fight of my career. If I don't win this one, I'm out as my career could be over. I could get seriously injured. There's a lot of stuff that is on the line on fight night. That's not on the line in practice. Uh, and you only get two to four of them a year. If you're lucky in the UFC, it's, it's not like, Oh, we got another game on Tuesday and we got another game on Friday. You know, even the NFL, at least you get 16 of those, but 
that's a lot less than most other professional sports where you're just playing game after game after game. You can afford to have a couple bad nights and like no one even remembers it. Um, yeah. Whereas if you, you go out and have a bad performance in a fight, that could be one of two for the year. And then that could, you have two bad performances, your career could be over. Yeah, that's anyway, crazy. I got, I got sidetracked, but the pool brings that stress level. So when I took my fighters, I started doing pool stuff. Right away, I found out I can make them fail. I can get them fail. And the reason they're failing is because they're panicking. Because that's, you get to a certain point of breath holding and jumping and and you're now in this pool and you didn't, you missed the surface and you can't, you didn't get that breath. And then panic comes in, you drop the weights and you freak out. And then you beat yourself up for failing and for panicking. And I was like, this is a huge opportunity because we can now coach you for all of the mindset and physical tools at the point before failure, during failure and after failure. And then we can do it again and again and again and again, and we can keep repeating it. And as soon as you get better, I can induce more failure and more fear and all of that kind of stuff. So it was a huge training tool for that specifically uh, to teach people. We, we would talk about performance mindset. I, I went and did this workshop with uh, that, those NHL goalies I told you about, and the whole thing was based on performance mindset. So we used pool training, ice bath, saunas, breath stuff, all as tools to practice the performance mindset tools that we talked about. So I would teach a tool. We talk about application. We'd kind of do it in in the locker room and then we'd go out and we'd apply it into the pool or into the next evolution uh, which is really similar to what you and i were just talking about with the the tactical medicine course i did like there's only so much you can do in a classroom setting or the locker room and and then i'm like okay cool uh go use that on fight night when you're walking out to the cage and you're, you're having a panic response and see if it works so the pool allows you to do that stuff uh often teach people the tool and then allow them to use it and force them to fail and then scale it back or scale it forward. Uh, so that's something that's really, really amazing about it. And it's simple for everybody. I get people who can't swim, who are afraid of the water. And we had seals from, you know, dev grew and the most elite water units that are out there. And we can find failure for both of them. You know, the fear response, certainly different in those different populations, uh, some of them learn how to overcome it really quickly and how to, uh, you know, move through it, but it's just a really cool, uh, medium because of the, the fact that it's able to bring that because there's, there's something very, very primal about not being able to breathe underwater. And you can take the most hardened athletes in the world and bring them out. And like 30 seconds later, I can get them panicking and freaking out to the point I have to calm them down. Um, so that's a, a really cool thing about it, that it, allows you to to train in that area uh, which is just tough to do in a lot of other things if you were to do that physically like you could go to some navy seal boot camp thing and just sleep deprivation and starvation and all that but the cost of that would be two or three weeks for your body to recover from it versus i could do this training today and then you could come back and we could do it tomorrow and then you could go do your sport on saturday and we'd have no issues um so that's, that's something really, really cool about the pool training that I think is, I have yet to find another medium that mimics that. Yeah. And I don't, I don't think, I don't even know if it exists unless you want to talk about maybe the hypoxia rooms, it's, but the same kind con concept in that realm where I think it's just, you're playing on one of the biggest primal fears. And like, that's why I, I love the organization XPT in general, because it is a true human performance uh, industry. It's like, you guys attack this primal fear that does happen suffocation and drowning has probably got to be up there as our biggest fears in there. I don't know. I don't know what else would trump that. And then now you get this safe world where you, I also think as a coach, cause they're just watching you and Gabby coach um, at the XPT experience in Kauai, just to see it give you guys like specific opportunities to coach. And then like, and then one thing I, I really appreciate about you guys is that you don't, overcoach initially like as i was learning the un, like the underwater stuff it like i i had to teach myself and you give me like just these crumbs to to grow on where i think that's a kind of an overlooked um aspect of the coaching that i think i think some people they always want to oh get it right the first time when really like you let them fail or you let this fear or these other mental skills expose themselves then you're not then you get the real human response and you can coach upon that with your experience where i always thought that was just an awesome, awesome tactic you guys employed just because 
again, I, I, I just for myself, just learning um, where my kind of my triggers were underneath there, where my inefficiencies were, where I was wasting energy. And then you guys story tell beautifully, on, like in the realm of the actual, like what's happening and applying what like you see in the pool. And like Gabby did a couple of really cool analogies with me where it's like, okay, if you're reaching this, like, could you have gone farther? But you, she knew I had set this wall as my goal and okay, like where else in my life am I doing that? Or like where else in my life I'm not being conscientious of how I'm dropping something and so that I can efficiently pick it back up and all these things. It was, it was just, again, like I'm a, I, I, you know, I'm a big fan of the whole crew, but I think the the pool is just this perfect platform for it where um, I think just like, again, explaining the philosophy and, and again, it, it's for all humans. It's for those that can't swim to the seals, to the UFC fighters in that realm, like the water and that side of suffocation is just, I think, a beautiful teacher. Yeah. And I think the the power of like the pool is a great tool, but just like anything, tools are only as good as the hands that they're in. So I think with Gabby, particularly, she just does a phenomenal job of, of figuring out. She She's coached it so much, too, that she knows exactly what you're trying to do. So you gave the example of like the over analytical people. We get a lot of everyone who comes to XPT for the most part, are pretty type A, hard chargers, want to be in control, used to being in control. Uh, so the pool can be really challenging because they want to know, and how do I break this down? And then what's the expectation? And then we're just like, grab those weights and go and yeah. figure it out, you know? And then when you fail and you come back, people start asking all these questions. We're like, no, 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 no it wasn't that. It wasn't the technique. It, it was, it was here pick up the weights, do it again. And, you know, Gabby does a really good job of like not letting people uh, baby those things. You know, the people will come up and they'll, they'll make the, they'll ask a bunch of questions because they're trying to get extra breathing in between the interval. And they're not even conscious of it. They're not like, I need to breathe. I'm going to try to stall, but you can see these like stall tactics coming out where they're asking more questions about the technique and Gabby will give like one more breadcrumb. And then she's like, no, no, you need to shut up, pick up the weights and go. And then yeah. people just, you and she pushes you just enough where you have to figure it out. And then she breaks it down afterwards. And it's like, what did you do there? You know, did you create that wall for yourself? And you know, the stuff that you just said. So there's so many really, really good coaching points there. Um, and again, it's just, it's a super safe environment to throw someone in and just have them freak out and then watch what they do and then be able to help guide them through that afterwards. Uh, and that's the stuff that I think is so powerful because it, it transcends the pool. People, I think a lot of times, uh, particularly athletes, professional athletes, especially they'll reach out and they're like, they want to know the physiological benefits of the ice bath or the sauna, or they want to know they're like, they're not interested in the pool because they don't understand why they should need to be better at pool training. And I'm like, I don't give a shit if you never step into a pool or an ice bath again, after this workshop, I am not teaching you how to be efficient in the pool. I am teaching you how to be effective in managing your stress and your emotions and your thoughts under super high stress environments or failure environments where you, where you're failing repeatedly. That's what I'm teaching you. And that transcends into all these other areas of your life. And, and I don't care if you ever come back and do a pool training session again. Um, it's just a really powerful tool to do that. And I think, and it, it that's also why, uh, you know, a lot of the special forces selection and all of that use the water. Cause it's, um, I think for them, it's more of a, uh, filter almost filter yeah it's it's more of like they're not teaching you how to overcome this they're seeing who already knows how to do it and who can use those tools to get past that wall versus you know use this wall to to clear everybody else out we're using it more as like you know find that wall for you and then help you climb over that wall repeatedly yeah i think that's an that an, an awesome analogy and, and the realm where again it is it's like I just think it's I, I look at the world and it's tolerances in essence, whether it's like bullshit tolerance or CO2 tolerance, but stress tolerance and anxiety tolerance and or negative feedback tolerance. I just for some reason, tolerance has been big in my vocabulary as of late. But that's what that is. It's this this stress tolerance again. And and my view of high performance, like I, I look at a linebacker room in the NFL again, I, I just speak on what I know. And I look at all the humans in there, there's not a big difference between each one of those humans physically and their physical output. Like the separator is all up here, whether that's a piece and chaos or whether that is decision making, or maybe it is like a brute force, like genetic trait, that kind of thing. All those things are mixed into the multivariable world of 
the chaos of competition. But in that realm, that seems like one of the most worthy endeavors when you look at high performance is make sure that the stress and the moment or the game or the environment of a stadium doesn't influence like your capability as an athlete. And I think the pool just does that in a dying way. Cause I, I run the same thing with guys where it's like, okay, why pool, why the pool and, or why the breath work or why the sauna and ice? Like I need stats. I want the, I want to know that what my readouts are going to say in a month, if I do sauna and ice for this long or just ice or, Again, same thing, like, well, like, or they want the plyometric output increase because, oh, because like I'll, I'll tell guys, like, you should look into pool training just because, like, it, again, guys 30 and up in professional sports, like, let's, like, manage some of the risk and the plyometric stuff, but still keep your pop. Like, oh, you should look in, like, and I've, and I've sent people to your guys' stuff in that realm, too, where it's like, okay, but we're like, do you have research on it? I know, but no, but, like, we can make, <laughs> you can make the logical jump here that, this is more beneficial, but then like, I just think I probably undersell when I talk about the pool training, what an awesome stress tolerance teacher that it is. Yeah. And I do have a bunch of research on it from a physical perspective. So that's like the first thing I would use with performance coaches who wanted to know, like they were skeptical, they had questions and I would share with them some of that, but then you you put people through it and, and you realize the teaching tool that it is. Cause I think Anytime you get into psychology and, and that stuff, it, it becomes a little woo woo and people have questions of like, you know, what you're doing and people want, especially performance coaches, we want numbers and we want to see improved, uh, you know, uh, objective improvements. But I think one of the biggest things that you said that the difference between a lot of these professional athletes is, is what's in between the ears. A lot of what I used to tell fighters that I would work with is what got you here is not what's going to keep you here. Being the hardest worker in the room, the toughest guy in the room is what got you to the UFC. There, everybody in the UFC is the hardest worker in the room, the toughest worker in the room. That bucket is full. Like you're not going to get better than everybody else. And I know people want to hang their hat on it because it's partly what gives them the confidence. So you can't take that away. You can't just be all the recovery guy now and you give up the hard work element. Cause we see what happens with fighters who get too wealthy too quickly and they get too comfortable. Um, and then they, they lose that edge. And I think that's what so many fighters are afraid of or athletes, many at different sports. They're afraid of losing that thing that gave them the edge, which was working harder than everybody else. Uh, but when you get to a certain level, you know, you're in the big leagues, everybody's working for the same amount. There are no more hours in the day to be outworking people so it's about outworking people in other elements. Um, I, I interviewed uh, Carrie Lee Walsh once for uh, an XPT thing. And she was saying, being a professional athlete is about doing what's hard. But most of us as professional athletes think doing what's hard means training hard. Training hard is not hard for a professional athlete. We became professional athletes because we know how to push ourselves hard. For us, what's hard might be doing the recovery work, doing the corrective exercise, doing the breath work, doing the stretching routine. That's the shit that we don't like because it's not balls to the wall, push it really hard. Um, so that was something cool with, with me for the uh, the fighters that I was working with is implementing the pool training and, and some of these type A people. They've gotten by with just pushing harder. Oh, I can't do this. Push it harder. Do more. Be stronger. And the pool training will make you fail very often doing that which I think is a really important lesson for people at the right time that sometimes just pushing harder is not the right approach and being smoother and controlled and efficient and control and controlling the chaos is the right approach. And that's where you see these, you know, the great, great athletes that are guys, people like Anderson Silva that are out there that are just like, he fights 25 minutes and he just looks like he's out there, you know, playing just having fun, relaxed and calm. And some fighters get there because of experience or athletes, you know, that when you've played for 15 years in professional sports and been really successful across that, you get enough experience that you start to relax and you start, the whole thing slows down. And, um, but the goal is, can we get you there quicker? Cause a lot of athletes don't make it. A lot of them fall apart along the way because they just keep trying to push harder, push harder, push harder. Yeah. I think that's awesome. Cause you're talking about expanding their window of opportunity to live this dream make this money whatever it ends up being too where i think that because I, I i've been i've been calling that what got you there uh what got you there won't keep you there i call that the icarus paradox now where 
uh, obviously Icarus uh, flew up and his wings melted. So obviously the, his wings didn't work in, in the right environment of that high stress or high temperature. But besides the point, um, no, I think that's, again, the right mindset. And I think that even just how you communicate it makes logical sense. But now it's like, okay, how can I get there faster? And like, again, the pool and the breath and all those things I look as a great lever. Um, but then, uh, just, just cause I know it's, uh, it's in, uh, on your plate as of late, the, um, United defense tactical, um, if you want to talk about some of the breath as far as application, um, and, and the military or like the tactical space. Yeah, for sure. I, I, I've gotten into shooting and shooting sports over the last couple of years, uh, was never something I'd experienced with, but I was always, I was always super passionate about working with military. Uh, in my career, I was either going towards professional sports or military special forces. I was always kind of applying for jobs in those, both of those sectors. And the sports one is the one that took off for me. So that's where I ended up. Uh, but I've always enjoyed working with, with those um, tactical athletes, we'll call them, but um, military and first responders. And I had the, the uh, once I started getting into shooting sports myself and First, for self-defense purposes, I started learning a lot of the tactical training um, for self-defense purposes. And then when I got into it, uh, obviously, I'm I'm a bit obsessive with things that I do. So then I started looking into ways to compete and started doing some of the tactical games, which I'm actually doing the next, another one this weekend. Um, so I started thinking about how do I apply the tools, the performance tools that I know from training athletes into this new sport or environment. Uh, high stress environment because most people when they're using a firearm they're either in a competition setting or they're in a life or death situation uh, so i started thinking about how can we simplify and use these tools and the cool thing that i started doing which i realized that i hadn't yet seen much in that space and, and i work mostly united defense tactical uh there are a bunch of ex-military guys but we the, the primary training demographic is civilians so what i started doing is when I would go work with uh, elite military special forces and I would talk to them and share breathwork techniques and the stuff they were doing, or excuse me, the stuff that we're doing, and they would share the stuff they're doing. And we would kind of problem solve about how they can use some of the tools. And, you know, a lot of them, I'm not teaching much. They're, they're doing a lot of the things that I'm, that I'm talking about. Uh, it's more just kind of educational guessing and problem solving based on things that their problems they're running into, but they would share stuff that they're doing that's been effective. And then I started thinking, how to uh, how could I take the the principles of this and scale this into something that applies for the populations here? So I built this this multiple part curriculum about performance breathing specifically for this tactical training. And a lot of what I was teaching these people is that the training that they're doing now is all motor learning, right? We're we're building motor patterns as we learn how to draw and present the, the firearm and how to engage different targets. It's all motor learning. And breathing is one of the eight fundamentals of shooting what that they talk about. But it, everybody I hear talk about breathing is it's just lip service. It's like, and don't yeah. forget to breathe. Yeah. And then we move on. And that, that's like saying, you know, grip is one of the fundamentals. Don't forget your grip. Yeah. Like that's not helpful <laughs> for me. What am I doing wrong and how do I fix it and how do I remember it? So I started implementing this really simple. Uh, right now, it's a three part series that's built into their curriculum. But it was like, what is the importance of breathing? And what is a simple way that we can already start to implement breathing? So the first thing I did was just teach people to coordinate breathing with their draws so that as they're, if they're brand new and they're building this motor pattern of drawing a firearm and presenting it, because you do hundreds and thousands of repetitions of that. And that's obviously the foundation of all of the next level of skills. A lot of people, when they move quickly and they get into the, the higher stress situations or even just like, okay, competition now, draw and shoot three targets as fast as you can, and they hold their breath the whole time. So I was like, how can we program that from the baseline? So all we do is I, in the curriculum, we do a draw and present drill. And as they draw and present, I have them inhale through the nose as they're drawing and exhale slowly as they present and just do that over and over and over and over and then build it faster and faster and faster so that when you get to the, and that's, I developed that for them because I was doing it myself when training for the tactical games, because I caught myself drawing, holding my breath, engaging a bunch of targets and then going and then running to the next thing. So I was like, how can I break this pattern? So I started building that um, motor patterning into the same neurological patterning they're doing with their draws and presentations. 
And then once they build that, then it's like, that's the foundation. And then as they move to the next level, we built a mechanics thing, which was more about just teaching them the basics of breathing laterally and getting that 360 degree expansion, which then plays over into how are we breathing now when we're in comp compressed positions, you know, we're kneeling behind cover. If I don't have the breathing variability to access all of the parts of my lungs, my breathing is going to be impacted. A lot of stuff we do is with plate carriers. So breathing is impacted law enforcement. They're in com compromised positions, carrying gear, military carrying gear. So it was a lot of like basic mechanics, but how does it apply to your situation? So even for them, the drill I had them do was the same draw and present, but now we're focusing on draw, present, take three lateral rib, 360 degree breaths. And you can do it. Some of them, I had them do it with like a cord wrapped around. So when they're at home doing dry fire, they draw and just take three big expansion breaths. So again, we're just, we're patterning that. If you're going to be drawing and presenting your firearm to build that pattern, then inc implement the breathing into it. So it just becomes like this strong neural connection. Um, and then the last week stage of it that we're teaching is now, once they have those two foundations, now we can start to use our breath as a tool and we can use like, okay, we're running between positions or we're in high stress and we we're behind cover and we need to now engage or respond or whatever. Then it's more of using those clearing, a couple clearing breaths and then a couple down rig breaths in order to get themselves ready for the next thing. And it might only be, I gave, I gave like a specific downshift protocol, um, which is really similar to what I use for new people in the ice bath or for uh, even like after high intensity activity, it's like a three stage meet the nervous system where it's at and get control of the breath. So it's like, might be two, might be 10 of those, depending on the level of intensity, of the activity. Uh, and then it's a couple for them. I have like a four, five, six. So it's four of those fast clearing breaths. And then it's five in the nose, out the mouth, power breath. So still big, powerful, but we're starting to get a little control, get nasal. Um, and the principle behind that, so it's get control, get nasal. And then the third one is slow down. Now I have them start slowing the exhales. And it might just be a couple, you know, you might do one, 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 and that's, and now you're on, but those three breaths you did that were purposeful are going to take you much further than just, okay, and I'm trying to reload and I'm, you know, it's chaos and it's getting control of that chaos with, with some purposeful breathing. Um, so it's cool. I, I mean, we just started implementing it. It's, it's all techniques that I've been implementing for myself in the stuff that I've been doing. Uh, but I think it's a really cool, just purposeful way to include breathing into these high stress scenarios. Uh, so these people can just have more tools to be successful. Yeah, it kind of comes full circle to your example with the two humans on the bikes to start the conversation where it's the same thing. You bring that intention and you you apply the tool very simply, whether it's short or a little bit longer exposure to it. And now you get just to reap the benefits, which I think is really very special. Um, where So where can people find that course at? Currently, that's only available at United Defense Tactical. So the, they have one location here in Southern California in Costa Mesa, but they are franchising. So I built that curriculum to go along with their awesome training curriculum. Uh, so when the franchises start opening up, I think they're going to be franchising this year. Uh, that will be part of the curriculum at any of the UDTs that are out there. So uh, yeah, they, they do a great job in their training. They're very systematic in their process. So uh, that'll be something to look out for too. And I don't, I have yet to come across any, especially civilian tactical type training that actually has any thought behind breathing, um, let alone something that I think is really, really tactical and simple. That was yeah. my goal. Was like, none of these people need to be breathwork specialists. You just need a simple tool that you can implement that allows you to be more successful. And maybe that one or two breaths is, in, is used at a time that you're in a life or death scenario. And maybe it allows you to just make a little bit smarter decision. You'll never, we'll, we won't really know um, if it works or doesn't work in those types of scenarios, uh, unless you, you hear from people. But I have heard from many, many, many elite military, these stories of like, my buddy got shot, you know, I knew he was going to bleed out. He was spurting arterial blood. I had 90 seconds to figure out how to save his life. And the first thing I did is take a deep breath. 
And then I went into my, you know, my tactics and tools. So I've heard many times that those, and, and the deep breath was specifically, you know, one good clearing breath and then get into to what I know how to do. So, um, you know, I know, I know it works at the highest stress levels and hopefully that stuff can start to play over into these other people's lives and uh, they can use it across the board. Most well, likely use it like when they get in a fight with their spouse or when they're in you know, traffic or something. Cause that's the, that's the real world approach where this stuff, you know, will, will pay dividends and, and hopefully you never, no one ever has to use it in a life or death scenario. Yeah. And I, I always like those little, again, the nuances of everyday life where it is the arguments and the traffic where it's just okay. Cause I, when I start coaching mental skills and stuff, I start talking about mass transitioning from work to home to be the, to be the father and whatnot. And, breath is just a beautiful tool to transition the in between those masks or um in stressful scenarios but i think one of the kind of a cool underlying theme there is because just because i felt it because i wasn't raised around guns and so now in like the past five years i've been much more exposed to the weaponry um but like that just having the presence of something that has the ability to take life again adds to the stress of the scenario same as the pool does, like that's a little more primal, but in the same world, like we're scared of getting shot too. And so I like that, again, you see the breath become this tool across all platforms of stress and then obviously high performance. And then we've touched on the whole gauntlet of um, normal humans all the way to the high performer. So, um, and we've been ripping for about an hour, dude. So uh, that's about all I had for you, but I, I do, I greatly appreciate your time. Uh, where can, where can everybody find you? Uh, me personally, you can find my social media is uh, at Coach PJ Nessler. And then most of the stuff that, that I put out is through XPT. So at XPT Life on all social channels, xptlife.com. Um, that's the best place to find all the stuff we've been talking about. And a ton of this stuff is in the XPT app as well. Boom. Yeah. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll link all that in the show notes and um, you'll be tagged and XPT and all that stuff will be tagged in correlation with all the posts as well, dude. But again, awesome. thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Easy. Be well, brother.